Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is uh, History is Here to Help on a given Thursday. And we're going to talk today about right wing extremism and domestic terrorism uh, with Peter Hoffenberg, a professor of history, and Jean Rosenfeld, also a professor of history. Right? Did I get that right? Okay. Uh, let's let's begin with defining our terms. If I tell you we're talking about right wing extremists, what is a right wing extremist for this discussion, Peter? Well, I'm going to uh, defer to Jean to start. Uh, Doctor, I was going to ask her to define domestic terrorism. Oh, well, I'll, I'll let her define both. And then we can have okay. a conversation. But uh, if, if you, your uh, viewers are just joining us, I just want to say Doctor uh, Jean Rosenfeld is a scholar of the history of religion. And among her particular interests are the relationships between religion and nationalism, religion and populism, and particularly today's topic, uh, religion and how we're going to define uh, terrorism and um, extremism. So let me defer, thank you, Jay, and let me defer to uh, Jean to get us started. Um, I think it'd be really helpful because the words are thrown around all over the place. Well, we should Jean. add that third, the third leg of the stool would be religion. Yeah? Perfect. And where okay. that plays in the definition of these right. two terms. So again, right-wing extremists, this is not an easy task, Gene, yeah. uh, domestic <laughs> terrorists and religion. So can you help us define and connect those terms? I'll try. I'm <laughs> sure everyone has their own ideas about it. They're very common terms. But to quote a famous scholar on terrorism, um, terrorism, he describes very succinctly, as violence unrestricted by the rules of war to pursue political agendas. So it is also uh, directed at targets um, that are selected to further that end, a political agenda. And of course, if you have are targeting a political agenda, you need an ideology. Some people speak of religions as ideologies and ide ideologies as religions. So religion is a condition of being ultimately concerned, according to my colleagues in the history of religions who study new religious movements, commonly called cults. And religion as ultimate concern means that which you are willing to die for or live by means of. It's, it's a, a coherent to you, a form of belief that you live by and are willing to die for. And we saw this in January 6th when the people who entered the Senate chambers had a prayer meeting. That's mm. what they did with the shaman. In, in, the, in, the, in the Capitol building? In the Capitol building. And oh some videos show this and some did not because when you see a video, it's edited and they often edit out the religious portions of it, things we recognize as religion. And they'll say, oh, no, that's, that's not important. So they, they put it into the trash can. And we scholars take it out of the trash can and look at it very carefully because um, human beings create symbolism. And symbolism creates meaning. And people become invested in meaning. They connect to one another. They bind themselves together by meaning. And religion also means, uh, it comes from a root word meaning to bind together. So you bound together with ultimate concern about things you're willing to die for and things that you live by. And it can take any form because human beings are very creative and they create all these, what we call fictional narratives that they become invested in and it becomes an alternate reality for them. And that's kind of the shortest version I can give you of ideology, religion connected to the political agenda they seek to achieve as a result directed by that ideology and that interconnectedness that they feel that sense of meaning. And so, Domestic terrorism is some is terrorism which is, doesn't extend beyond the boundaries of the nation. Although when we speak about our domestic terrorism today, it does extend beyond the boundaries of our nation. The relationship between right wing extremists, and here we're getting into this, uh, who are responsible maybe for 40% of the ter domestic terrorist acts in the United States currently, they reach out to Europe and Europe reaches out to them. So you have like groups in Germany and other places in Europe that they're affiliated. They know each other in Scandinavia and Germany. This Aryan preoccupation with white supremacy is I think more distinct 
and better to focus on than right-wing extremists, quote unquote, because the right wing isn't necessarily terrorist. The right wing is legitimate, it's conservative, and we need a right wing, okay? But uh, to balance us, as Joe Biden pointed out the other night, but extremism is kind of a generic word that avoids in, you know, insulting anybody. But let's look at the core belief that unites the current 40%, uh, the people in who attack in El Paso, who attack in San Diego, who attack in Philadelphia against Jews and Hispanics and other targeted groups. Um, Both and Asians. And Asians. But this is more of an individual thing. I'm, I'm speaking now. Well, yes, and, and we can get into lone wolf terrorism, but I don't want to complicate things. Right-wing extremists is better thought of from Charlottesville in 2017 to January 6th in 2020 as uh, white supremacy based on a fear of being replaced by alien peoples and upwelling of something very common in American history called nativism. Well, I am much more <laughs> troubled about all those three terms than I was a few minutes ago. Thank, thank you for the <laughs> definition. Would you like uh, to, how about you, Peter? Are you, are you more or less you troubled more. about them? I will trouble you some more. Um, I completely agree, as usual, with uh, Gene. I would just add a few things, particularly from the um, European perspective, since I'm a historian uh, of Europe. Um, my difficulty with religion, in the way that Gene described it, not Gene's description is being problematic, but the issue is not really whether you're willing to die for your religion. The problem is, are you willing to kill? your religion. I think you should be very careful. For example, in Jewish tradition, there is a tradition of martyrdom where one dies. Uh, there is not a tradition of martyrdom where one kills other people. So I think we have got to be very clear about the distinction between willing to die for something and willing to go and kill for something. And I, I think that's more problematic and more troublesome. Um, it's a troublesome, it's an issue, I think, which transcends religion and transcends nativism. Uh, it's a question of the militarism of our society. So I think today the distinctions between, you know, Professor Appleworth is a dear old friend, but the distinctions between, you know, non-state, non-military and domestic terror are blurry. Many terrorists, domestic terrorists are either uh, current soldiers or policemen, they, are, they train themselves as military units. Uh, the conspiracies are military attacks. So I think we're dealing with a very fundamental problem of militarism. That is uh, the necessity to be violent. And violence, which is not like a Buddhist monk lighting himself on fire to protest a corrupt war. It is uh, a kind of militarism which says, I, I'm going to kill some of this. Okay. Uh, secondly, I think that Gene is absolutely right about connections. And the connections really go way back, uh, particularly connections of uh, ethnic nationalism. Um, everybody knows, I'll just remind them, uh, that many of the uh, German policies were based upon American literature. American and not a file policies, but based upon American writing. And in fact, if you look at some of the most stringent ethnic immigration laws, anti-Asian, anti-Eastern or Southern European, uh, they're based upon the 1920s American immigration. So Gene's absolutely right about the connections, but the connections are not just a product of uh, current events or a product of current uh, technology. Um, I'm deeply concerned about the blurring of the lines very much. Well, I'm, I'm a and I would just, I would just end with um, terror, Terrorism, I, I mean, Grappo is absolutely right. Um, what European historians, though, would have is that terrorism is based upon uh, fear. It is based upon telling somebody else that wherever you are, I could eventually get them. And so there is a kind of politics to this, uh, certainly. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the nature. And that's where military operations and domestic terrorism often Often match. Okay, so that'll trouble you even more. You'll probably never well, I'm, yeah. I'm troubled not only by the, the you know the, the silos of these definitions, but by the connection. 
among the groups that you define and describe. And uh, my question to Jean is, uh, you know, what's the dynamic here? It seems to me that there's, there's a legitimate question as to whether these groups have more connections now. You described, and it was shocking to me, um, you know, the connection of, um, you know, domestic terrorists with foreign terrorists. That's very troubling, especially in Germany, of course. Um, but I'm wondering if we have connections among all, all of these right-wing groups, all of the, the right-wing religion, right-wing extremists politically, and, and of course the, uh, you know, the white supremacists and, and domestic terrorists. <clears throat> it seems to me that before we could, we could see them in isolated silos to some extent. They didn't necessarily come together. They were doing their thing, whatever it was. But now it, it seems like they, they, have, they have found common ground, that they do in fact talk to each other, that they do in fact plan and use social media to do conspiratorial thinking. <clears throat> and, and I think the January 6th affair uh, was a way where they could rub shoulders, rub elbows, talk to each other, make, make, make relationships. And so when they left, wherever they went home to, um, they carried these new relationships. And now we have these, these various defined groups connected more than before. What do you think? Well, first of all, uh, I'd like to just pause for a moment and go back to the very fine point that Peter made about militarism and freedom to kill. Uh, there is a fault line that runs through new religious movements or cults. Uh, and that fault line is between violence and nonviolence. What's different uh, about uh, uh, jihadism from conservative Muslims? A, a significant difference. And the same thing obtains with our terror groups today in the United States. Are you willing to act as the hand of God? Uh, in 1985, uh, a, a paradigmatic group called uh, uh, the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. And they acted as the Arm of the Lord. These are groups that feel not only that um, they must die for something if necessary, but they do have a, um, a mandate to kill under certain circumstances. And you go to every major group that has committed homicide or terror, and you can always find in their literature and in their teachings that which says you may kill or you must kill. Okay. And I won't go into detail, but you can do this with every group, just about. Secondly, back up a little bit in terms of the definition of terrorism, it is beyond the rules of war. War has rules. Terrorists have their own rules and they're different. They're irregulars. They're not a well-regulated militia. They are irregular militias. And we have to discern what their rules are in order to beat them because sometimes we can use those rules against them. But basically they are not the standard military per se. They can infiltrate and take over the standard military as they did in Nazi Germany they are not the standard military. And so we need to recognize that it's beyond the rules of war. It's something, that's why we call it terror and we set it apart. There's something very different. Um, okay. With respect to connections, let me simplify it by going back to the first instance of domestic terrorism noted by David Rappaport in the United States. That was uh, Samuel Adams. In Massachusetts, the Boston Tea Party, the Sons of Liberty, the tarring and feathering of British sympathizers went on for 10 years from the Stamp Act of 1865, 1765, Stamp Act of 1765 until 1766, and then uh, 1776 when we had the beginning of the war. And I'd like to even jump further and look at what's the all these separate issues of terrorism, what, what binds them together, there's a paradigm. First, you get a sense of oppression. Then you get a response to that sense of oppression. And, and, and the Stamp Act was the sense of oppression. Then you have the slogan of no taxation without representation formulated by the Sons of Liberty in a regular group under Sam Adams. And they also had committees of correspondence, meaning that they didn't have an internet but light groups grew up in several of the colonies. 
and they had secret correspondences. So they, they had, didn't have an internet, but they had a means of communication. So there's always a means of communication to bind them together and their sense of connection. And then you have a consequence as a result of these resistant long-term terrorist groups, Sons of Liberty 10 years resulting in a revolution. Okay, again, in the civil war, you had uh, the run up to the civil war, you had a bloody Kansas in the 1850s after the Missouri Compromise, comparable to the Stamp Act. Then you have the irregulars in Kansas, including John Brown, and you had the massacre in Lawrence, Kansas, and the resulting massacre by Brown and his sons in Potawatomi in, uh, I believe, 1856. And then ultimately in 1859, you had Harper's Ferry, and in 1860, you had the Civil War. So there you have, again, a provocation and a regular response and a consequence. The consequence of dividing the country into two separate dual opposites that could not reconcile. And so you had a national consequence. It sounds like these, these ramp ups, um, you know, we can learn from them, of course, but it sounds like we're in a kind of a ramp up now, Gene. Maybe. Maybe. You know what happened? Actually, there was a ramp up in the 1990s. There was a low level insurrection in the United States that was greatly troubling the FBI. It was almost overwhelmed. You had in 1993, I believe, uh, in the incident at Waco, which was not right wing extremism, uh, it was a religious group, an apocalyptic religious group. Then you had a response to that in uh, 1995 with Oklahoma City, which was the greatest act, most horrible act of domestic terrorism. And it was to incite a revolution. And it was based on an ideology, which was an American Nazi uh, ideology expressed in the Turner Diaries that Tim McVeigh uh, admired and enacted as the hand of Kisgah. And then you had, um, uh, the Jordan Montana uh, standoff of the freemen who were operative in multiple states and really distressing local municipal governments and overwhelming judges and juries. And it was an ideology of separating oneself from American citizenship and creating a whole new system in the United States or at least the Pacific Northwest. They wanted to actually secede in the Pacific Northwest. So in the 1990s, you had a lot of incidents of terror against the police. You had uh, incidents of terror against the populace. Well, there was an assassination of, of Allen Berg in Denver, a Jewish officer show host mm -hmm. uh, by the order. And it looked like we were really going to ramp up to something. But then what happened was 9-11. Um, and these groups went underground. And then they popped up again before Donald Trump. And it so, in Charlottesville. So interesting. So you can see it, you know, I, I see it um, kind of like a bacterial colony, forgive me this, uh, where there are various life phases in the bacterial colony. And one of the phases is, um, you know, the, uh, the, the phase where it's, it's just knitting together, you don't see it. And then later on, it, uh, it, it shoots up uh, in, a, in a very dramatic way, reaches a plateau. Um, and it, at that point, I suppose you could have real violence by a number of people, and then ultimately it dies. Every bacterial colony works that way. And the only, and the only end to the bacterial colony, uh, well, the, the end is natural, but the only continuation of the colony is when some other bacteria are introduced. There's something to be learned from bacteria. I always feel that, you know, there's something to be like, Peter, <clears throat> this, is, this is all very troubling. The notion that we are involved in a ramp up now and that things are knitting under the surface, maybe we don't see it necessarily or realize, um, you know, where it goes, the dynamic uh, could, could go to those violent military people. Um, and it has happened before. I wasn't aware of this, Jane. I studied American history at college, you know, but I wasn't <laughs> aware of this. 
<laughs> so, Peter, if we are in a ramp up now, uh, what are the signs that we should be looking for? As far as a ramp up, we should be, be looking for whether or not those who Gene has described are either ignored or abetted by one of the two major political parties. I mean, these, these issues really become nationally dangerous when the quote unquote normal politics in one way or another either ignores AIDS or abets. So that's one thing I would be worried about, whether people in office are going to come out and speak out against it, uh, whether there'll be some kind of regulation of arms. So that's one, one concern. And as long as one major party assumption ignores this, or in some cases cultivates it, we do have a problem. Um, secondly, and this, uh, Gene and I approach this as dear friends from very, very different perspectives. So from my perspective, as everything that's been described as error has always historically been described as freedom fighters. So we have a really a macro issue about whether or not society is going to accept violence of really any nature. Because most of the acts of domestic terror are in response to state terror. And nobody's mentioned the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers were a large, quote unquote, either freedom fighting group, right? Or terror group. And I'm going to answer your question by saying that the state and government has to do what we're trying to do and take positive steps to improve the general life of society. And the way, one of the ways to attack a bacteria, right, is to isolate the bacteria. Yes. And you isolate the bacteria by having the rest of the petri dish be healthy. And then you have a big dose of antibiotics. So one of the things that worries me, and this I'm sure is exactly in Gene's wheelhouse, is the number of local sheriffs who are part of these groups. Right? In other words, the number of folks who are important intersection of law and order, the oath takers, for example, who really are borderline terror group. I mean, a, a, an official of the government who tells people not to wear masks, or an official of the government who says that eight to 10 guys conspiring to potentially murder the governor of Michigan were just a bunch of good old guys hanging out. That's a real political problem. Uh, these groups are most dangerous when they have traction within the general political system, okay? And thirdly, I, I am very concerned that uh, we are not appreciating the fact that for many people, there is no distinction between state government violence and terror and non-state government violence and terror. You know, when the US government decides to pull out of Afghanistan and the same year increases the Pentagon's budget, that's not an end of the war anti-militarism effort. So I do worry because one of the responses, right, to uh, white Christian right-wing militarism is for black groups to arm themselves. Yeah. And I, I do see a dangerous, you know, Romeo and Juliet, where the families are dueling. And the prince yeah. is going to have to say, you cannot duel. And the way to say you cannot duel is to get away, uh, get these guns out of public life. Well, you anticipated my, my next question to Gene. Um, if, we, if we look at the people who are willing to kill, um, then we, we have to look at guns. And what we and when we look at guns, we find that there's a lot of people who are wedded to guns, and it's a psychological, sociological question: How many people really need to have the comfort, the power of a gun, or multiple guns? And um, after a while, they get to think how they would use those guns, and then they contort the Second Amendment um, to license uh, to keep those guns, and the government is is unable. Uh, it doesn't have the political will pretty much everywhere in the country to stop those guns. Uh, how does that play into this, this line we are talking about between the nonviolent and the military violent? This has got to be a significant 
um, a, a significant feature, a catalyst, if you will, uh, to take these people over the line? Well, a gun is an instrument. It, it's an instrument of death. It's also a tool. And why do you wear a gun? Uh, it's something that can lethally, you know, is a lethal weapon. Fear. The police, we, we gave our police guns. They didn't do that in Britain. They gave their bobbies sticks. Now they wear guns, perhaps. Now we're giving them tanks. <laughs> Leftover military equipment, right? Now we have hostage rescue teams, SWAT teams. Hostage rescue team in the FBI, SWAT team in the local police departments, uh, which are based on uh, special forces in the military. They're all connected. They all know one another. When something is performed in the public, um, in the public official way, it's subject to vigilance and controls and limitations and professionalism. People, we learned from the Derek Chauvin trial that police are trained in the application of force. There is a rational training method for applying force because the police often are facing military type situations with people where, you know, they, they are assassinated. That happened here in Honolulu, actually. And so there, it, it's a question of perspective, of training, of political acceptance by the body politic versus, again, over the line, you have the irregulars. You have the ideologies, which are new and creative, and focus on the mandate for violence mandated by a, a power above and beyond, a god. And you have control by a secretive group only, as the committees of correspondence set their own rules. They're not the rules we live by, they're different rules. And you have a political agenda, which is to divide and to foment chaos and revolution to destroy the existing system in any way possible by recruiting people, by influencing people, by giving them lethal weapons, by telling them that you are the sons of liberty in the current generation and wearing the symbols of the Boston Tea Party and the Gadsden flag, don't tread on me, which is from the war, I believe, of 1812. And, and, and you go back and you, you influence people in this way to make them think they are freedom fighters. You know, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. So it's again, the gun is an instrument when it's employed by those with a lethal ideology, then it's an instrument of terror. When it's applied by those who are abiding by rules that we all conventionally accept, then it's, and it's a tool to maintain stability and peace. Gene, well, it's just, I want to ask thoughtful. you, Peter, for a final I'm comment. Answer, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, okay. Jay. Because Gene is thoughtful and rational. That's a broad view of the world. I would like every American to tell me why any American needs an AR-15. It is a simple question. There's no, there's no good answer for that. There is no good answer. And that, but it is, it is in the DNA of the not, country that this is happening. It is in right, the but for example, of it. It, it, is, it is, but it, it's, a, it's a matter of establishing uh, public safety and public good. And that may require the old tradition that the state, I mean, ever since weapons began, the state made an effort uh, to monopolize the means of coercion. The difference is we're supposed to have a democratic state. But as soon as there were handguns in Europe, uh, there were laws regulating them. Uh, one of the reasons you can go to England and have a great time seeing the castles is that the armories were established. Romeo and Juliet is all about what happens when two families who don't like each other have what for the time was a weapon of mass destruction, which was the sword, and went out on the street killing each other. So Gene is absolutely right about it being a tool, but it is a tool whose only purpose it to fire an excessive amount of bullets at a rapid rate accurately. And there is no, no good reason. There is no reason, good or bad, 
for anybody to have that. Now, will that end extremism? No, it will not end extremism. But if you believe in economics and how much people are willing to put into something and what the cost of something is, it's going to be a hell of a lot more difficult to do a lot of things that people would like to do if they didn't have these weapons, if they didn't have the military training to use them. I mean, don't you find it odd that everybody wears camouflage shorts? See, to me, that is an, uh, an oddity in a liberal society. And it is almost equivalent to carrying weapons. It is the militarization of clothing. Why would you wear camouflage shorts to the beach? What are you, what are you saying? Are you saying that the mili military clothing is attractive? You're making a statement. Gene, let me yeah. ask you the last question uh, because we have to go soon. And that is, um, you know, if we take weapons out of the formula, if we somehow get Congress and the state legislators, state legislatures uh, to, to ban or seriously limit weapons outside of government, you know, just hypothetically, um, would, that, would that solve the problem? Peter suggests it will. No, uh, I said we would not solve the problem. We would not solve the problem. No, how, how do you feel about it? Well, in 1866, Alfred Nobel invented dynamite, which made bombing possible, which made international terrorism possible, and started off the four waves in the late 19th century. In 1866, he invented dynamite and, and with the anarchists in Russia. And then, of course, it came to the United States with any market and all that. Um, so there's always a uh, it's the way you wield the weapon. I mean, that made bombings possible. It made mass murder possible. Why do we have the Nobel Prize today? Because Alfred Nobel felt so guilty of what he unle unleashed on society, which was a weapon of mass destruction. And we see bombings today, what they have resulted in. Um, the sword. The sword was employed uh, after 9-11 to terrorize people through the executions. Remember the, the quote, Beatles in Iraq? It's the British Arabs that were, were uh, cutting off the heads of their hostages. That, you know, it's not the number of people that are killed in this case. It's the, the video of it to the world and the terror it incites in other people's hearts. So, they're using the sword in a, in a different way, in a, in a way that, that goes beyond the rules of war. It's their own rules, which they write. So you can have anything as a weapon. The gallows that was set up in, in front of the White House, uh, in front of the Capitol on, Jan on January 6th, was an image of terror because it was then associated with the threat to Mike Pence. And also, it, it was associated with the Turner Diaries and the uh, scene in the Terror Diaries where they set up uh, gallows from lampposts in Los Angeles near UCLA to execute professors and liberals that associated with Blacks and other peoples. So the gallows becomes a symbol and it becomes something larger than itself. It's not a weapon, but the threat of a weapon and then the intent and and the political intent to use it. Well, this goes this goes terror. to Peter's point. Okay, if you don't, ter terrorists, if you think that terrorists you, terrorists taking the weapons away yeah. may not solve the problem. If you can suggest that uh, there there are other ways to hurt people and kill people, um, you know what, you guys? So uh, we're out of time. I, I we could go on, and I want to go on, and I hope we can. Gene, is this okay? We can schedule another show with you. I like that. <laughs> Uh, we'll continue this conversation because, you know, the world around us is changing and thus the conversation is changing. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Gene. Thank you. Uh, th and thank you, Peter Hoffenberg. Thank you very much. Great Take discussion care. here on History is Here to Help. And it does. Thank you, Jay. A lot.